Uh, not forgetting Pastor Mbugwa, a good friend of mine, for the good work he's doing amidst you. Pastor, we were with him in the same theological seminary. Uh, he has added weight slightly. <laughs> Uh, and it gladdens my heart that we are still together in ministry. I remember him as a very down-to-earth minister of the gospel, and he was such a good chef while in college. We uh, thank you, Pastor uh, and Shepherdess, Madam Ruth. We are praying to you. That the Lord in, in, in abundance of his love and riches in glory will prosper your ministry even as you shepherd his flock in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, finally, I want to thank Elder Alphonse and his family. Uh, such a lovely and warm family. It is important to report to the church that I enjoyed every second of my stay within their walls. Yeah. Sister Molin, uh, Pam, Apache, Petty, a very lovely family. Amen. I am doubtless that uh, God, uh, in the abundance of his providence, We'll fight your battles and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I am Churchill, together with my wife Christine, our boy Jeff, and girl Rachel, sends you greetings in Jesus' name. Amen. If you allow me, uh, permit me to say a prayer, then we get into the message of the hour. Heavenly Father, the grass withers and flower fades, but thy word endures forever. Holy Spirit, behold this audience. This audience of men and women thirsting for your word. Men and women who are gathered here with a great sense of desire, a great sense of hope, a great sense of anticipation to hear from you. Holy Spirit, I plead with you that you will make me effective one more time, that in the stillness of your voice you will speak to us. Lord, come and have thine own way. Not I, but Christ be seen, be heard, be known, and be exalted. To you be glory always, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone title is Victims of Circumstance. That is the title of our sermon this afternoon. Victims of circumstance, victim of circumstance. And our message is derived from the book of Mark, chapter 14, and verse 9. Permit me to read it one more time. The book is Mark 14, the ninth chapter. These are words that came from the lips of Christ himself. My Bible says, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. May I mention, even as we get into this message, that Mark is the shortest and simplest of all the four gospel books. In the book of Mark, Christ is presented as a compassionate savior, a God full of love and pity for his people. It is a book 
that presents Jesus as an active and obedient servant who constantly ministers to the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of others. Now, in, in Mark chapter 14, we are face to face with a story of an anonymous character only described as a woman. This anonymous character in Mark chapter 14 is anonymous not because she did not have a name, but she is anonymous because she was a victim of circumstance. It is said that this woman came from a well-known background, but even the fame of her background could not give her any identity because she was a victim of circumstance. It is recorded in history that this anonymous character called a woman was a sister to a very popular brother a brother who had been raised from the dead and his resurrection thrust him into a national fame. But even her popular brother could not give her any identity because she was a victim of circumstance. This someone is dedicated to anyone here present who feels that he is a victim of some circumstance. This is a message dedicated to people who are broken and bitter because they are victims of circumstance. This message is a dedication to those who feel messed and wasted because they are victims of certain circumstances. Yes, this message is a dedication to those who are so low, those who are so broken, those who are so tired, because they are victims of circumstance. People whose hearts are exceedingly sorrowful, those who are a pale shadow of their former selves today, those who wake up, go on their daily runs, come back to their houses in the evening with a burden of bitterness in their spirits because they are victims of circumstance. The words in Mark chapter 14 verse 9, is a culmination of a very long story. A story that began in the temple and ended in the temple. It is important to remind you, church, that in ancient Israel, in ancient Israel, what we call a temple, any other time you open your Bible, not merely a place of worship. In the olden days, yeah. a temple was a complex. Uh, I have learned over time as a preacher that every other time you open the pages of your Bible, you are face to face with the stories that happened so many years ago. In other words, a modern day Bible reader, every time you read your Bible today, there is what I would call a chronological gap. The gap between you, a modern day Bible reader, and the original recipients of these words. That gap is so long, so long that it covers over 20 centuries. And that explains why sometimes we don't appreciate the beauty of the Bible. We read some of these stories, but 
They don't come into our hearts with their full force. A temple in the olden days was not merely a place of worship. All the political activities of the nation of Israel, all the legislative activities, all the intellectual institutions of the land were domiciled in the temple. So that the temple was a very central institution in the nation of Israel those days. Sacrifices would be offered in the temple. Litigation of civil and criminal matters would be done in the temple. Worship would be done in the temple. So the temple was a very central institution in fact. If you wanted to attack and overthrow the government of Israel, you needed to look no further than the temple. You would merely go and attack the temple and Israel would crumble down because the temple was the heartbeat of uh, the nation. This anonymous character began her troubles in the temple in Jerusalem. It is said that this character was called Mary. Students of Bible history, especially Jewish history, are in agreement that this woman talked about in Mark chapter 14 was called Mary the sister to Martha and Lazarus. They lived in a small village called Bethany. Bethany was not very far from Jerusalem. In the land of Israel, Jerusalem was the capital city. And Bethany was one of the streets within Jerusalem. That is where Mary Martha and Lazarus stayed. May I mention to you, church, that every other day, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary would join the rest of the nation in the temple where they would sit at the feet of the priest to be taught about the Mosaic Code. In the temple in Jerusalem lived a priest called Simon. And every other day Mary and her cohorts would go to Jerusalem. They would sit at the feet of Simon to be taught about the dictates of Torah. But the pen of inspiration says something about Mary. The pen of inspiration describes Mary as a young girl who was very humble and beautiful. Mary was beautiful to behold. In fact, Sister White says that Mary possessed a bewitching sense of beauty. Yes, a bewitching sense of beauty. She was beautiful in demeanor. She was attractive to look at. And daily, whenever Mary went to Jerusalem temple, her beauty was envied by her peers. Everybody admired Mary for her looks. Everybody wanted to appear close to Mary. Mary became a celebrity in Jerusalem, courtesy of her physical attraction. Unfortunately, church, one of the people who was attracted to the beauty of Mary was Simon himself. And one day, history records that after their temple services, Simon called Mary aside. An anointed high priest Descended too low. One who stands before the most holy place. One who is revered and respected in Israel, Simon. 
Simon forgot about his title. Simon forgot about the dignity of his office. And the history painfully records that Simon lured Mary and defiled her. Lucky Summer, let me pause and look at you straight in your eyes and make this statement. Some of us are highly privileged in society. But any moment that you will take advantage of the trust and confidence that the Lord has allowed others to have in you, Whenever you will take advantage of your position of influence to bring a wound in the heart of people brought under your care, oh, heaven will be disappointed in you. We serve a very emotional God. A God who will not ignore impunity. A God who will not assume the tears of his people. If I had time, I would have explained to you how heaven reacted to Simon's, to Simon's act of impunity. And in a matter of moments, Simon had to exit the priestly office and join the rest of the lepers beyond the gates of Jerusalem. We serve a God who cares about the emotions of his people. Never take advantage of your position, never take advantage of, of, of your office, never take advantage even of your title to, to frustrate humanity. Did you know? But wherever we are, heaven expects to trust us and use us to reveal glory to humanity. I admired a doctor recently who handled one of his patients and just as the patient was walking out of his office, this health worker and Adventist medic looked at his patient set in his eyes and asked him, Sir, can I pray with you? And he offered a prayer to his patient and the patient had to look at him and ask him, Doctor, which church do you attend? And he told him that I am a practicing Adventist. Heaven expects of us to be beacons of light wherever we are. Fellow Adventists, I want to plead with you passionately. Do not take advantage of the frustrations of people. Do not be the reason behind the tears in people's faces. In Israel, there was nothing as valued as sexual purity. You look at the books of Moses, they were very pernicious laws and dictates about sexual purity. In fact, in the Hebrew culture, whenever a lady came of age, and she was considering marriage. One of the tests that had to be done was the test confirming whether she is sexually pure or she lost her virginity. It is said that when Mary came of age, this poor sister of Lazarus and Martha wanted to consider marriage. Her request was presented to the temple. And in line with the cultural laws of the time, a test was conducted to men, 
to verify if Mary is still sexually pure, a test which she lost. Mary was found to have lost her virginity. A council was called immediately to discuss the fate of Mary, a council that they called the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the highest judicial tribunal in the Hebrew legal regime at the time. It was a council of 72 elders. But the law allowed that any 23 could constitute a quorum for the council to sit. It was also required that such a meeting could only be chaired by the high priest. No one was allowed to convene a Sanhedrin council other than the serving high priest. So Simon was invited to preside over the case of Mary, a woman whom he himself had defiled. Poor Mary, victim of circumstance. Mary was not invited to tell her side of the story. A verdict was hurriedly arrived at. The council said that we are not going to stone Mary. However, she can no longer live among the commonwealth of God's people. She must be chased out of Jerusalem and Bethany for that matter. Church, this life can make you do things you vowed you can never do. Life can push you too far and you find yourself into environments you vowed you can never step into. Whoever imagined that Mary could be declared a social outcast, a devoted, humble Israel girl, a lady who loved her God, a lady who was committed to the dictates of the Most High. Today, a verdict is given declaring Mary a social misfit this life. And it is said that when Mary received this letter communicating to her the resolution of the Sanhedrin, she didn't bother. The content of the letter did not pain her because they were true. She had broken her virginity. But what hurt Mary most? What broke the heart of Mary? was when Mary, having gone through the content of the letter, Mary saw the name of Simon, the signature of Simon, and the seal of Simon as the high priest. That is what broke Mary into pieces. Mary was like, so Simon can declare me a social misfit. So Simon can preside over my eviction from the family of God. So this is how life can be unfair. Those you trust most, hurts most. Anyway, Mary took the letter, tore it into pieces, she went to Lazarus, her brother, and Martha, her sister, and bid them by. Church, that is how Mary exited the gates of Jerusalem temple, victim of circumstance. Nobody understood Mary. Nobody was willing to listen to Mary's side of the story. Everyone blackmailed Mary. Everybody asked Mary, Mary, why? Why did you allow this to happen to you? Mary, your parents were so good. Everybody blamed 
Mary for her wounds. Poor daughter of Israel, victim of circumstance, had to exit the gates of Jerusalem. And it is painfully recorded in history that Mary avoided the clear roads. For the first time, Mary wished to die. Mary followed through the wilderness and forests and mountains. Mary left the compound of their humble abode in Bethany. And Mary even wished that some wild animal would come and devour her. Throughout the night in tears, Mary left asking God, God, why? God, what did I do to you? Father, what is my mistake? God, I thought I would find solace in the temple. Why? Mary asked herself so many questions, church, and she blamed God. She blamed life. She was so bitter. And it is recorded that Mary journeyed the whole night. And when it was dawn, Mary found herself in a town that she had never stepped into. This town was next to, to, next to the Sea of Galilee. And upon looking at the environs, the pen of inspiration records that Mary realized that she has landed in a town called Magdalene. In fact, other historians say that Mary inquired that where, I, where am I? And she was told that woman, this town is called Magdalene. And you are able to confirm later on, if you have study Bibles, you will realize that Magdalene is just by the Sea of Galilee, quite far from Jerusalem. That is how Mary landed in Magdalene. And Magdala was known for two things. I will say one in the interest of time. Magdala was such a popular town in the then world. Roman soldiers would come from the other yonder and when they got to the shore of Magdala, there were apartments rented by ladies and women who would sell their bodies out in exchange for money. That was their livelihood. Sex was idolized and worshipped as a god in Magdala. Commercial sex was the order of the day. Magdala would only be compared to the Old Testament town of Sodom. Magdala was a very notorious center. It is a center where marriage was no longer a respected institution. That is where poor Mary landed in. And let me tell you, church, there is no deadly animal in the world but a human being who is bitter. No one is as dangerous and reckless as a person, a young lady, a young man acting on bitterness. One who feels messed and wasted and has chosen to take the way of revenge. Mary, with all that bitterness, landed in this hidden town of Magdala. And one day when Mary paid a visit to one of her friends, and Mary saw the flashy lifestyle of this young lady. Mary looked at her apartment and the nature of life the young lady was living. And Mary was shocked. And she inquired, young girl, you are so flashy. 
you live so well. What do you do for a living? And Mary was told to relax and be oriented on how to survive in Magdala. That is how Mary was initiated into adultery. This life can make you do things you vowed you can never do. Life can make you make statements that you never imagined can come out of your lips. Life can take you into habits that you once condemned and said over my dead body. Poor Mary, victim of circumstance, Mary got into a, a, a adultery with all bitterness and pain. Mary did not mind. In a couple of days, Mary had broken marriages and families. In a couple of days, Mary had caused bloodshed. Mary became a celebrity in Magdala. If you went to the pubs, Mary's name was all over. You went to the busy streets, Mary's name was all over. You went to any apartment, Mary's name filled the air. Even in churches, the talk was about Mary. To the extent that the people of Magdala named her Mary of Magdalene. Listen, church. Be very careful when this world turns you into a celebrity. Be careful when life turns you into a celebrity, when society celebrates you too much. Because the devil is never patient with the people, I can tell you. We live in a world that does not believe in us. Ours is a society that cannot entertain your recklessness for long. You will never break marriages for long. You will never cause heartbreaks for long. One day your sins will catch up with you. And you will wish that the ground busted and consumed you. It was not long before the town of Magdalene hatched a conspiracy against Mary. And one young man volunteered that I will walk into Mary's apartment and then you can come after I have sent you a signal. That is what happened. So Mary was a victim of a very cruel conspiracy. Did you know that the next day, quite early in the morning, if you read a book called At Jesus' Feet by Doug Batchelor, that book observes that quite early in the morning, at about 3 a.m., Mary hears a knock on her door which was very unusual. And Mary told herself that, no, I am an adulterer, yes, but I have never received a client too early. This is not usual. But because that was a lifestyle anyway, she welcomed her guests and the history records that Mary closed back her doors. Barely 10 minutes later, there was noise from the streets. Mary was like, what's going on in Magdala? She peeped through the window and saw the entire town of Magdalene gathered. Everybody with a sword and a stone. The temple rabbis, the priests, the businessmen, it was not business as 
usual. All the shops were closed. All offices were closed. Magdalene was out for a killing. The writer says that the temple rabbis and the priest poured into a small private place of business intent on the kill. Mary could not explain who opened her door. And she was paraded naked before an angry mob. People were shouting, Adultra, shame on her, Adultra, shame on her, shame on her, shame on her. When they marched Mary naked out of the gates of the city and laid her down there for a stony. That was the worst day in Mary's life. The crowd was ready to stone Mary when a teacher of law gave a suggestion that before we kill her here in Magdala, I suggest that we take her to Jerusalem. There is someone in the temple of Jerusalem. He calls himself the Son of God. He says he's Jesus of Nazareth. He claims to be the Lamb of God that taketh the away the sins of the world. He claims that in a matter of weeks, he will go to Calvary, that he will be hanged on that emblem of suffering and shame to atone for the sins of the world. Let us give Mary audience with Jesus. And that is how Mary secured the death with Christ. Let me tell you, church, there is no story heaven cannot change. Amen. There is no shame God cannot cover. Amen. There is no tear he cannot wipe. There is no life, even if it is stinking as what, that God cannot freshen. Amen. Mary had a date with Jesus, and she was taken to Jesus. The pen of inspiration says that when they got to the temple, and Mary saw the walls of the temple, she remembered the day that she was defiled by a priest. Mary remembered one day they were told about the story of Jezebel in the temple. Many remember how Jezebel, the harlot, was also stoned because of adultery. Mary hopelessly accepted her fate and said, It is okay. Let me be the second Jezebel. I am a victim of circumstance. Mary lost any hope of ever coming out of the temple alive. When they got to Jesus, a group of scribes went to Jesus and called him. They looked at Mary and told Jesus that this woman was caught in the very act. They narrated the Torah and asked Jesus, what do you say? My Bible says that Christ stooped low and with his fingers started to inscribe certain statements on the dust on the temple floor. While all that was happening, the crowd was running impatient. They were shouting, Adultra, stone her, kill her, shame on her. Others whom Mary had broken their marriages found the occasion to spit on Mary's face. Mary coiled like a snail, waiting for the stones to bury her life. In fact, Mary was half dead. Nobody knows what Christ was writing on the floor. 
But it is imagined that Christ could have been writing the sins of Mary's accusers. He who knows how to read the depth of people's hearts looked at Mary's accusers and saw that three quarters of them had been Mary's clients before. <coughs> this life, and while Mary was waiting to die, everybody abandoned their stones and arsenals and walked out of the temple gate. And Jesus was left alone with men. After what seemed like eternity to Mary, the gentle hand of Jesus touched her shoulders. And Christ whispered into her ears, Mother, the Bible says Mary lifted up her head. The first sight that met Mary's eyes were the heaps of abandoned stones. When Mary looked at the hills of stones heaped around the court of the temple, just when Mary saw the arsenals piled on top of each other, when Mary saw how the, the temple court was littered with every manner of arsenal, she knelt at the feet of Jesus. She looked at Jesus and told him, Master, I have seen my death today. Jesus asked her a simple question, where are your accusers? And you know, in a court of law, even today, I think, maybe lawyers in the audience can confirm, if if, if, if an accused person is taken to the court and a determination is to be made by a judge whether that case should proceed to full trial and the judge takes his bench and he asks about the prosecutor damning the accuser and the accuser is missing in the courtroom. And the judge asks again about any witness. And the witnesses are missing. And the judge realizes that he is only face to face with the accused. What is the fate of such a case, if not dismissal? So Christ looks at Mary and dismisses this case. He tells Mary, woman, I don't condemn you neither. And Mary looks at Jesus and tells Jesus that my accusers ran away out of guilt and shame. Their hands were not clean. When you ask about a person who has never committed sin, they all left. In any case, most of them had been my former clients. Mary asked Jesus that Jesus, you alone, the law allows you to kill me. Jesus, you are spotless, you are sinless, you have never knocked my door. You are a spotless son of God. Will you stone me, Savior? Will you take this sword and butcher me? The Lord allow you, Jesus, to kill me. For I am a sinner, you are sinless. What will you do with me? At that point, the picture of Calvary came to Jesus where he was to be hanged in a couple of weeks. Jesus remembered his agenda of salvation. And he told Mary, Mary, let me pick your shame. Let me take your adultery. Let me take your sin. Let me proceed to Calvary. Have my righteousness. 
Let me die that you may live. Amen. Christ told Mary, go. Just go. And sin no more. Amen. That is the extent of God's love. Amen. Are you a victim of circumstance? Are you bitter in your heart today? Have you been through situations that has pushed you too far and you are not the person you used to be? Church, I am asking, is that really your life? Is that you? Or are you just a victim of circumstances? You know, Mary left the temple as, as, as though she was in some movie. And it is recorded that when Mary got into her apartment, poor lady sold everything. And she went and purchased a very expensive perfume. And she said, before Christ gets to Calvary, I must anoint her in readiness for her burial. News meet Mary that Jesus is having some feast in Simon's house and Mary was there in a moment. She knelt at the feet of Jesus. Her tears dropped at the feet of Jesus. She wiped them with her long natural hair and she took that alabaster jar of expensive perfume. My Bible says she broke the jar. She did not open it. She broke the jar. In other words, Mary wants a complete break from her past. She is tired. Even that perfume bottle, Mary does not want to take it anywhere, for it will be a painful reminder of her story. Of course, others complained. Busy bodies complained. But Jesus rebuked them and told them, leave her alone. It is at that point, church, that Christ made these statements in Mark 14, verse 9. That wherever this gospel shall be preached, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of as a memorial for her. In other words, Christ picked an anonymous character and immortalized her name into the pages of sacred history. So there's no story that God cannot change. There is no tear that he cannot wipe. There is no shame that he cannot cover. I wish to pray with someone this afternoon. Take a moment and look at your life. Are you a victim of circumstance? Is that your life, honestly? Do you look at yourself and you wish you were never born? Do you look at your family and you wish you were not part of that home? Has life pushed you into lifestyles that you once vowed you can never lead. Could you be looking at your marriage today and you regret the day you met that partner? You wish you were single. You have vowed never to forgive. You have vowed with your heart to hate and hate forever. Are you a victim of circumstances? I wish to pray with someone here. Maybe you are a young man or a young lady, but you feel you feel messed and wasted. I am reminded of a young boy I once met somewhere in a group of other young men. And I learned painfully that people can be paying prizes that are not theirs. Someone can be shedding tears that they don't deserve. This young man was in a group of his colleagues 
Apparently, they were doing this business of, of Boda Boda because they all had bikes. When I was passing in front of their shed, I had a voice call me pastor. And I first, at first I ignored the voice. But when he saw me go, he shouted even louder, pastor. And I had to pause and give him attention. Church, when I got closer to that group, I saw a very desperate young man. He was bare-chested, he had removed his shirt and hung it on his shoulder. In one of his hands was a piece of smoked cigarette, halfway smoked. All over his body were funny tattoos in his chest, things that were very scary. Her eyes were, his eyes were red, 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 red hot. When I looked at this young man closely, I learned that I knew him. And I asked him, Dan, has life come to this? Dan, you smoke these days. Dan, what are those tattoos doing on your body? Dan, why are you not in school? And he told me that, Pastor, it is a long story. Tell me when you are free, I will share with you. And I gave this young man an appointment, and he came. And indeed, it was a long story. This young boy was merely a victim of circumstance. For he told me that, Pastor, five years ago, I was in a high school, a form two. And we were sent back to collect some arrears for our fee. This young man told me that, Pastor, when I got back, I found Dad. And when Dad saw me, he asked me why I am back. And I told Dad that fee balance is needed in school. Poor Dan told me that his father made two steps towards him. And his father looked at him straight in his eyes and called him three times, Dan, Dan, Dan. This young boy told me that, Pastor, having called me three times, my dad told me that, Dan, I have two kids. Officially, I have two kids. One is in grade four, another is in grade two, let them do their exams, I will pay their school fee. As for you, Dan, stand up. Get behind the building. Where we buried your mom a year ago. And Dan, if she can hear you, please ask her from the bottom of her grave where she got you from. Dan tells me that, Pastor, I went back to the road and took the vehicle to school. When I got to the gate of our school, there was a big notice by the gate that only those who have nil balances should be allowed. And he tells me that, Pastor, that was my, my last day in school. Could you be a victim of circumstance, somebody? Are you doing things that you vowed you can never do? Are you carrying a burden that is not yours? Heaven has sent me to tell you that there is no story he cannot change, there is no tears he cannot wipe as a matter of fact, it found that one of my church members at that time was the chairperson of CDF in that constituency. And when I booked Dan an appointment with him, Dan was enrolled into full scholarship. Amen. And upon doing his form for, 
Thanks a kiwa the place in Masinde Muliro University of Science and Technology. He pursued computer science and in 2018 he graduated. There is no story that God cannot change. There is no tears he cannot wipe. What has happened to you that makes you feel too far from the grace of God? It's my prayer that God uh, will change your story if you allow him. His grace is sufficient to cover your past. His love is sufficient to cover your shame. He can open a new chapter in your life and write your story afresh. Is there someone in this audience? Who is saying, Heavenly Father, may your grace cover my past. May your love cover my shame. May you heal my bitterness. I am a victim of circumstance, but I want a restoration of my joy. I want to see your hand upon my life, and I want you, Heavenly Father, to do it to me like you did it to Mary. I want to pray with someone here who is saying, Heavenly Father, your grace is sufficient for me. I want you to fix my broken life. I want you to heal my wounded spirit. I am bitter, I am low, I am broken, I am almost discouraged and depressed. Somebody in the audience and you want the grace of God to cover your life and your family, please stand so that we share this prayer. Grace that exceeds our guilt and shame. Thank you so much. We want to do a stanza of that number. 109. And as you do that stanza, you are free to drop your prayer request in these boxes that we can dedicate them to the Lord. If you want baptism, just write your name and your contact and drop it in the prayer box so that after that song, we do this prayer together. Please hide if you 
Umesema tu ambao wamebeba mzigo mzito wacha kwako na Mungu wetu utaweza kuwapumzisha. Hii tusikie leo uweze kupumzisha watoto wako. Mtumishi ambaye amepeana neno kutoka kwako, umemnunia mafuta ili aweze kupeana neno lako. Asante ubariki zaidi, mbariki na familia yake. Mbariki katika kiroho. Mchunge asije akaanguka katika mtego wa ule mofu shetani, lakini bali azidi kukusimamia na kupeana neno lako. Kila mmoja wetu na kusimama mbele ya kiti chako cha enzi, sikiria kusikia kilio chetu na uweze kutujibu kama vile ulivyojibu mbele na ukaweza kupatia tumaini mpya katika maisha yake. Jina lako liweze kutukuzwa. Asante kwa kujibu maombi yetu. Asante kwa kusikia maombi yetu. Asante kwa kutenda huru katika jina la Yesu Kristo Bwana na kwa amen.